to open your Bible and keep your Bible open at Galatians chapter 5. We're here to listen to the Word of God. And we're going to read down these, some of these verses. So let's take our time and let you follow, just you follow the Word of God as we read it uh, together. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And you just let that word again ring in your ears, because we once ourselves as these people were, were fettered and bound and chained and enslaved in sin and nature's night. And praise God that he has snapped the fetters. And praise God he has made us free. And he's saying here, don't be again going back to those, those bondages of the past. I have no intentions of going back. I'm free and I'm going to remain free. Hallelujah. Verse 2. Behold, I say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. They were telling the converts, the Gentile converts, that they needed to be circumcised uh, as well as being saved. And Paul's counteracting that, as those of you know who were here last week. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now that doesn't mean that we're lost again when a man or woman's really genuinely and honestly saved. This Bible teaches that they cannot be lost again. And they're not fallen out of grace, but they've fallen away from grace. And it's easy to fall away, you know, from the grace of God. And this is what happened to these uh, Galatians, and this is what has happened to many of God's people. They haven't fallen out of the grace of God, but they've fallen away from the grace of God. Verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait uh, for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcised, scission availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, scission, but faith worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you in other words, he that preaches this false doctrine to you, he shall be judged, he shall be in judgment, whosoever he may be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would there were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all that the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, that's where we're going to end our reading uh, this evening. And God has promised to bless to us the reading of his word. We are continuing this evening with the subject to bewitched believers beware and we're taking a text tonight and our text is from the heart of these 14 verses that we read in Galatians 5 it's verse 7 and I want you to cast your eyes on verse 7 and you just think of your own spiritual state and those of you who are listening to me abroad, wherever you might be tonight, watching or listening, you just think of yourself if you are a Christian. Ye did run well. 
Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Paul's challenging these believers from the evangelical church, and it's an evangelical or evangelical churches in Galatia. He challenged them after he discovered that they had backslidden, erred from their faith, and embraced another gospel, a false gospel. They added to the gospel of grace, which he cannot do. And as well as the being saved and uh, being born again, they were told that they couldn't really get to heaven or they couldn't really go through with God if they didn't add works to their faith, which is completely unscriptural. So to faith they added works, and to grace they added the law, and to Christ they added Moses, and to uh, the Spirit they added the flesh. And I believe that the Apostle Paul, and I showed you that last week, I believe that the great Apostle Paul was grieved in his heart and soul, when he heard about the state of this church and these many believers who ran well for God and was blazing a trail and going through with God, I believe that he was visibly shaken whenever he dips his pen, his quill in the ink and writes on the arch on the parchment, "Ye did run well." And then he asked the question, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now this text tells me many things. And there's one thing that jumped out at me first of all. It's possible to run in the race for God and not run well. Every one of us here tonight, if you're saved, you're in the race because the Christian life is likened on to a race, which we haven't time to explain tonight. But you could be in the race and not running well in the race. Are you running well in the race for God? These people were not running. They did run well. They did. One time. One time you ran well. One time you were in the prayer meetings more than you are now. One time you witnessed. One time you preached. One time you loved the Lord more than you love the Lord now and something has got in and hindered you. Now before he goes on to explain and point out where this hindrance comes from, he makes it first absolutely clear where it didn't come from. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. This persuasion or the word there is, this persuasiveness cometh not of him that calleth you. It didn't come from God. You remember that tonight. When God calls a man or woman into faith, when a man or woman is truly born again by the Spirit of God and translated into the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness, there is no provision for them to go back. God doesn't make any provision for them to go back, nor, nor you make no provision for yourself to give no, make no provision for the lust of the flesh to go back. It was never God's intention that any man or woman would go back. We go back of our own accord. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 9, just glance at you haven't far, maybe not to turn at all your Bible, but chapter 4 and verse 9, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known God, how turn you again to the weak and the beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? And he's thinking about the slave. Why would the slave want to go back into bondage once it's set free? Why would you want to go back? Why do people want to go back to the beggarly elements of the world when they've been set free from drunk and set, drink and set free from drugs and, and set free from thousands of other things and they're free and they know they're free and it's gone and it's away and then something happens and they're back into the beggarly elements and they're back slave, slaves again to the devil. Why? That never, my friend, was God's attention. Back with the yoke of bondage. We sing free from the law, O oh, happy condition. 
Jesus has died and there is remission. Now your eyes on this text. Get it on this text. This word who here is the same word in chapter 3 and verse 1 that we were at last week. Who has bewitched you? Who has led you astray? It's the same word here. And this word says here, he said here, who did hinder you? Now, he's not talking about a system hindering. And he's not talking about the Judaizers and the false teachers and the legalistic seducers that hindered these, these Jewish people, that hindered these Christians from going on. He's talking about, he's coming in more closer than that. He's coming in more deeper than that. He's coming into an individual. Who? You see, there's something behind all this that Paul can see and we can't see just when we read the Scripture. But I hope to show you tonight what it is. And by doing that, I want to show you some of the great problems that is one of the great problems that's in the evangelical fundamental church tonight. He goes away beyond. He goes away beyond an inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He goes away beyond to the source. And I can prove to you tonight that he's talking about the Satan, the devil. Who? Because that's his work. That's the only one, my friend, the only one. The force of power and darkness of the devil is the only one that has the know-how and the ability to infiltrate, separate, and decimate a church of God's people. And that's why Paul in the first chapter we saw last week, or in those verses that we saw last week, that's why Paul said, I marvel. I can't take it in. I can't understand why you have removed so quickly from the faith. It's astounded, Paul, to think that over less than a year, these people that were blazing for God, baptized, meeting God round the table, and then they started to go back. He says, I can't understand it. My friend, that's the work of the devil. That's nothing only the work of the devil himself. Look at verse 15 of chapter 5. Look, look at the state that they'd got into. Is it not familiar? But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. They're at loggerheads one with another in a short time. Who can do that? Only the devil. When the devil gets into an assembly of God's people, I tell you, he can wreck it in a very short time. And that's what's happening today across our land. That's why there's so many splits and schisms in our evangelical churches across the land. The enemy has got in like a roaring lion. And he's not in a hindering individuals, but he's hindering whole churches and whole assemblies of God's people. And he has rendered them void and powerless. I have two headings tonight. Satan stopping the progress and saints standing in prayer. And they're both in these verses that we're going to read. As I said already, the Christian life is likened on to running a race. And it's very easy to run poorly, and it's very easy to lag behind, and it's very easy to give up. But we're told in the Word of God that we must run and keep running. And now he's saying to them, who has hindered you? How is it that you have been diverted and persuaded to give up? Something small, he uses the word there, a little leaven. The leaven speaks of sin. Just a little bit, a wee bit of leaven gets in and it destroys everything else. And just some wee thing got in. And these wee, the, the wee, wee things that got into this church was, they were saying this, you, 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 it's all right to be saved and it's all right to be born again, but you need to do this as well. No, you don't need to do it, we'll see tonight. Oh, you're all right to be, oh, be born again, and Paul's right in what he's saying, but he's not going far enough. Yes, he is going far enough. 
which I'll explain to you tonight. And so some little thing got in and it started with the wee thing and then it matured like the eleven and it got worse and worse and worse. Is that you tonight? Is that you somewhere out there tonight listening to me or watching me? You're nowhere tonight for God and you used to be brilliant for him. Is that you tonight? Some wee thing got in, some wee quarrel, some wee argument. Somebody said something to you. Somebody give you a drink and you're going away again. Someone give you a drug and you're away again. Well, that's just what's happening here because he uses the word hinder. Now, you listen to me tonight. This word hinder means to, it's a powerful word when it's sought out in the Scriptures. This word hinder means to drive back and beat up That speaks to me of force. That speaks to me of violence. You see, there is more behind this than just a man or a people with their views and ideas. J.A. Beaton, on his, co his commentary on Galatians, says it means to smash and break up the road before the runners so that they have to turn aside or turn back. Beat or drive back. The Greek word for hindrance is anakarazo. Now listen what that means. Cry out loudly and scream aloud. Restrain somebody by a toddler, for instance, running out of your presence and out into the road and, and you let her roar at the child and you run after the child and you drag the child back. With force, you take the child back. That's the content of the word. And that's what the devil was doing here with force. He, 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 he got in and he manipulated and he hindered them from going back. Now, I want you to turn to Mark 1 and verse 16. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Keep your finger in Galatians 5. Mark 1 and chapter 16. The Lord's commencing his earthly ministry here. He's calling the disciples. And you listen and watch what happens. Verse 16, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for there were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they, first their, they, they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship and the hired servants, and went with him after him. And after they went, in, went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, they entered into a synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man, now watch this, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. That's the same word. That's a demon trying to hinder the work of God. That's a demon trying to block the authority of God's word. But read on. Saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth, that thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, now here's the same word again, 
and cried with a loud voice. He came out of him, and they were all amazed, insomuch they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Can't you see what's happening here? The gospel is beginning. The Lord Jesus is calling his disciples. He's the first time into the, into the synagogue in Capernaum. He's on the Lord's day, or the Sabbath day. And he goes in there and he's encountered from inside by a demon. Not from outside now. Inside waiting for him in, the, in, in this place on the Sabbath day is a demon. It's not from the outside. In here there's a hindrance to the gospel. There's a hindrance to the word of God. There's a hindrance to the authority of the word of God. And there's a hindrance to the truth of God's word. And it's the devil that's doing it. It's the devil that's doing it. And the Lord closed his mouth and the word is he muzzled him, he shut him up. Turn with me to Mark 6 and verse 46. I'm making a case for the who. Mark 6 and verse 46. You're going to see it coming now in another context, but it's still the same. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Mark 6 and 46. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, or a phantom, or a ghost. And they cried out. That's the same word. All the disciples cried out with fear. What? Why? They wanted to hinder this phantom coming to them. They wanted to stop this. They were fearful. They didn't recognize that it was Christ. They, they thought this, the life was scared out of them in the storm. This phantom, this, this ghost is coming towards us. And they cried to hinder, to drive back, to beat back the power. That was coming towards the same context. So I hope that you can get into your heart and into your mind tonight what we're dealing with here when we're dealing with opposition to the truth of God's word and why we're so powerless and paralyzed in the church today. Think about those things. Let it, let it sink in. One more, turn to Luke chapter 23. And that will do us, there's many more we could turn to. We're just establishing who the who is here and what his business is and what his job is. Luke 23 and Luke... Luke 23 and verse 44. We're at the cross. Our Lord Jesus is hanging naked on the cross at Calvary for your sins and for my sins. And we're coming to the last part of the cross in the sixth hour. Verse 44, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in two. And when Christ, now here's the very same word, here's the word hindrance, here's the word blockage, here's the, here's the word stop, here's the word to hold back. 
And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit, command my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. At that moment, my friend, he had cried, finished. And when he lifted up his voice, and he cried, finished, and he lifted up his voice, and he said, into thy hands I commit thy spirit, he hindered the powers of darkness. He blocked the demonic powers of hell and delivered us from them through the cross. That's why when we come to Galatians, that's why we come to Paul's teaching in Galatians, we must never add anything to the gospel. Tis finished. Redemption's price is paid and the demons have been destroyed and the devil has been destroyed and darkness has been destroyed and death has been destroyed and Christ is alive. Oh, tell you what a victory was won at Calvary. Finished! Telelestai! Redemption's price is paid once, for all, and forever. Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone in Christ. And run away to heaven. But don't tinker with adding anything to it or taking away from it. Three quarters of the translations in Ulster would need to be burned. And I was going to say churches too, but I maybe get Belfast telegraphed after me. Anymore. Ah, my friend, listen. We dare not tinker with the Word of God. Nod to the Word of God. It is finished. Redemption's price is paid. And Paul's telling them this in Galatians just because of the cross. The old systems has been destroyed. There's a new and living way opened up. That's what Galatians is all about. The sacrifices is over. The offerings are over. The holy days are over. The goats and the bulls and the calves and the heifers, they're all over. It's gone. There's a new way opened up. Redemption's price has been paid. Paul emphasizes that in Galatians, who gave himself for us. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Satan stopping the progress, and he'll do everything he can to stop you going on. But you go on now. You keep praising, you keep praying. Keep crying the blood over your home, over your family. Keep into the prayer meetings. For he's defeated. Now, second and the last point to have, saints standing. And, and we're at, back at Galatians 5 and we're at verse 1. Galatians 5 and verse 1. And here we have stand fast. Now this is what he's telling these, these believers, probably those of them who hasn't gone the, the way the rest of them have gone yet. He stand fast, that is Stand steadfastly and perseveringly and stubbornly and don't shift and don't move. I could translate that that way very handy. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In other words, hold tight to what I have taught you and hold firm and stand firm on the old gospel truths. Now, when you come to standing here, 
your mind just takes you very quickly and very powerfully to Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians chapter 6 is there, and part of it is about the armor of God. And in, in, in the Ephesians 6, we're told to stand, therefore. Stand, stand. Three times you'll read about the word standing. And you should read that nearly every day. I put it on in my mind. I put the armor on every day in my mind. Put on the gospel, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace and the girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. And above all, now listen, above all, taking the shield of faith against what? The fiery darts of the wicked one. And I emphasize this often and I emphasize it again tonight. Probably the most important part of the armor of the soldier uh, in battle and in the race and running for God Probably the, be, the most important part is the things that we think the least important part is the shoes. The shoes, the soldier, he's, Paul's in prison, they say, and he's looking at a Roman soldier and he's coming down from the helmet and the breastplate and the, the girdle and he's coming right down to the, uh, to the shoes and he sees the shoes. You know the Roman soldiers had shoes, they had studs in the shoes. Half inch long studs. And when he's talking about standing, he's talking about the feet. Stand, therefore, having done all to stand and withstand. You see, friend, when you when the soldier dug his feet in and got those those clips down into the soil, he could stand. And as the fiery darts came, and they came with fiery darts, they had arrows and they had things wrapped around them like petal bombs that leapt around and let them loose at the armor. But you see, if those shoes wouldn't, if those feet couldn't stand the force of that coming, and for instance, if they went down, the rest of the armor was no use. The helmet was no use, and the sword was no use. If the soldier's down. So if the devil can get you down and he can get you out of the race, he'll make mincemeat of you and your family. So stand firm. Stand firm on the truth and keep the armor on and keep facing the demonic powers of darkness because in Ephesians 6 it talks about the spiritual wickedness. Wickedness. That's the who. That's the hinder. And once the devil, once the devil can get into an individual, into a family, and once he can get us to deny and buckle and wobble on the fundamental truths of God's word, he has us. Now, when I talk about the fundamental truths of the gospel, I'm talking about the incarnation, redemption, atonement, justification, sanctification, substitution, doctrines that you very seldom hear preached today. You take a survey, a survey tonight over the, I'm talking about evangelical churches across our land, and you find out how, how many of them have preached on these doctrines in the last six months or year. The virgin birth, the virtuous life, the vicarious death, the victorious resurrection and the visible return of our Savior are all fundamental truths that need to be continually preached. Oh, but we don't like that. Well, that's all right. Go somewhere where you'll not have to listen to it. These are the truths, my friend. This is the word, my friend, that God gave us to set us free. Not to bring us into bondage. To set us free. For the truth shall set you free. And he that the Son sets free is free indeed. 
Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, when he talks about the yoke, he's talking about the ox. And the ox would have plowed all day in the dance of heat. And whenever the harness and the, all the apparatus was pulled off the old ox, it would make its way out and roll down and kick up his heels in the field. I saw horses doing that. My father was about the only man down there when I was a boy had tractors and horses. And he used to work the horses and he used to work the tractors at the same time. I saw a tractor and a horse working together. And we used to, as children, watch the horses when they come out of the harness after a long day, running out into the field and throwing on their back and throwing their legs up. They were free from the bondage and from the yoke. Are you free tonight? Are you liberty tonight? Are you freedom tonight? Are you joy tonight? And that's what we're supposed to have. If the, if the cross of Christ and the deliverance at Calvary means anything, it means everything. It means you are free. Hallelujah. Sins are forgiven. Peace with God. All sins are under the sea of God's forgiveness. If you're not enjoying that tonight, enjoy it before you go home. I'm going to bring in a personal illustration here. And you know, Pat and I have had many words from the Lord. Over 40, 52 years, God has brought us into places and showed us words that were ye and amen and words that we needed. Pat had one sister and she died at 40 with cancer. Husband and a young child left behind. That wee bungalow in Derrigonley where her mother lived. We all gathered round in the front room of that wee house there at the 30 mile speed limit. And Pat's brother, with all of them with rosary beads, and Pat's brother said the Mass. We were standing behind and just as that mass was going on in that house, we're only a few years saved, nine, eight or nine years saved. God give Pat this word. Well, the pressure was on. You could feel the atmosphere. But you see, there were two in the midst of all that day, and good people they are and were. Most of them were gone. But you know, in the midst of that, there were two of us who were set free. By the grace of God, we were loosed and set free. God spoke into Pat's heart that day, and that verse has been one of the greatest verses that we have turned to over the years. This verse, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made you free, and don't you be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Ah, oh, my friend, the Catholic system is a system of bondage. And saying that, I tell you, there's thousands and thousands of Protestants in bondage tonight too. And I'm glad that I'm free, not from the Catholic Church and not from the Methodist Church, but I'm glad that I'm free from my sins and at peace with God. What a mighty verse that was. What a mighty, what a mighty word that was. The time is coming and has come when we need to stand for the defense of the gospel. And that's why we put that wee placard on that door as you come into your right hand side 12 years ago when this place was open. 
set for the defense of the gospel. And once we get away from the old-fashioned gospel and the truth that I have been preaching you tonight, we may as well close the doors. You see, let me say in closing, it's not the Gentiles and the ungodly of Asia that infiltrated these churches, that hindered them and turned them away, that they imbibed other truths, that they should never have other doctrines for truth that they should never have imbibed. You need to be circumcised. That's the work of the flesh. You need to go to the feasts. You need to keep the holy days. And I hope 613 prohibitions, the, the Torah, the law of Moses, 613. When I lived in Manchester in 1967, I lived in Cheatham Hill for a year. They were mostly all Jews. And I worked for a Jew in a green grocery shop and we had to light the fire for him on Saturday. He couldn't strike a match. Someone had to go into the house before the family and switch on the light. They couldn't switch on the light. A hen could lay an egg on, a, on, an, on, on the Sabbath day, but they couldn't touch the egg. They couldn't heat anything, they couldn't cook anything, and they couldn't drive. And that's the same today with the Jews, the strict Jews. All do's and all don'ts and all, all, all rhetoric and all talk. Prohibitions. But my friend, listen, we can carry that into the church and we can carry it into our homes and we can carry it into our families too. But don't just be looking at them. The evangelical church has, has tied up with do's and don'ts and do's and don'ts and there's no spirit and there's no power. There's no liberty. And it wasn't, it wasn't, my friend, the outsiders. This was, the, this was coming from inside. It was coming from the Jewish people, the the legalists, the separatists, and all those people were saying, yes, 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 you do this, you do that, but, 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 but nothing. Whenever a man or woman's born again by the Spirit of God and they're set free by the gospel, listen, the, Lord, the, the Holy Spirit will show you what to do. The whole Holy Spirit will show you where to go. People said to me, whenever you got drink, whenever you were drunk, or whenever you got saved, did you go back to the drink? Whenever you got saved, what, what, what about the bad language that you were using every day? I tell you, my friend, I, did, you, what, what, did you not go to the dances? I didn't want to go to the dances. I didn't want to go to the old friends. I didn't want to go back to the tobacco and I didn't want to go back to spitting and smoking into the drink. No, no, I was set free. The Holy Spirit will tell you where to go. You'll know when you're grieving the Holy Spirit if you do something that's not right. You say something that's not right. Or you go somewhere you shouldn't go. The Holy Ghost dwelling in you, he'll tell you. You see, these fellows had got caught up with this old tradition. And these were Gentiles. They were talking to Gentiles that knew nothing about this. They were putting these laws on them, these burdens on them, burdens and yokes on them. But it came from inside. And I want to make a prediction. I say to you now again, I said it on Sunday morning, it's not going to be, it's not the Sinn Féin that we need to be worrying about or the protocol. We have out there, there tonight, we have thousands and thousands of people that call themselves Christians. They go to church, many of them, and they take communion, many of them, and their elders in churches, some of them. But they see no problem in voting for sodomites. 
they see no problem in voting for abortionists. And if you can go into a polling booth and put your stroke beside someone who agrees with more than we children in the womb and transgenderism and, and, and 52, there's heard the day on the news, there's 52 MPs on the query in the House of Commons for sexual sins, 52. I just noted it down. All under scrutiny for sexual immoral con conduct. Most of the conducts is sodomite related. Rape of boys, pornography, <coughs> images of children. 52 in the mother of parliaments tonight in our land. Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't as bad nearly. That's the land, that's the government that we're. You see, all behind this is the devil. And the only way we're going to get to where we're going to drive back the devil, the only way we're going to hinder the devil is when we stand in prayer and intercession and supplication. Nothing else will drive it back. But of course, they can't drive it back until you know the source. And we know the source tonight. We know where it's coming from tonight. We know where the hindrance is coming from tonight. And it's not coming from the IRA. It's coming from these people that say, oh, everybody's Christians. Oh, we don't believe in that old slaughter gospel. The boy said to me, I don't. I wouldn't let my children go to hear Johnson. This was a Church of Ireland minister. I wouldn't let my children go to hear Johnson, he said, for that old slaughterhouse gospel. Well, I wouldn't like to tell you the way he ended up. No, we don't want this. Everybody's the same. Everybody's equal. If people want to change their sex, if they want to live with somebody, if they want to drink wine, it's all let them. Everybody, we're all going to heaven. No, we're not all going to heaven. Christ didn't die for foolery. He died for our sins. And whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're not saved tonight, you can call unto his name and cry to him tonight and he'll save you and he'll restore you and he'll put you back on the race again. Get back into the race again. Back into the battle again. Get back into the word again. Get into the Ephesians 6 in the morning. Get this armor on. And when the fiery darts come, and they'll come, you'll be able to quench it with the shield of faith. Let us pray.